So there was a massacre just a few days ago, really, <clears throat> a massacre uh, at a work event. It was not work-related, of course. It was um, Islam-related. Shootout, massacre. U.S.-born Farouk and Pakistan native Malik expressed commitment to Islamic Jihad and martyrdom in direct private online messages. And yet it was not caught by the Department of Homeland Security, Naval Intel you name the intelligence services that are busy making dates with each other on, on government computers, watching Internet pornography, spying on conservative groups, spying on conservative groups, spying on conservative groups. Obama has created a, in, an internal Stasi in the United States of America, an internal spy agency more concerned with stopping the political opposition than stopping radical Islam. Write that one down. Obama's Stasi was just rewarded today by his beard, Paul Ryan. So when I have this conversation on how to win at cyber warfare, it's almost a moot point. It's a moot point. Even if any of these ideas were enacted, what good would it be if you have a man in the driver's seat who was taking the bus over the cliff? What good is it? None of us have faith in him. It's a, it's a sham. I mean, look, I'm controlling myself. I watched this speech this morning by the charlatan on his way on vacation. He was again late by how long, Robert? 30, 40 minutes? 45 minutes he made the world wait for his speech. You know who used to do this? Hitler. I'm not comparing the two in terms of politics, but I've studied the history of demagoguery and crowd manipulation. And Hitler was very famous for showing up late and then making everyone wait before he began his speech. Did you know that? He has some good advisors. I got to tell you that. He has some excellent advisors from Hollywood on how to keep a crowd anxious and on their toes. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. Savage. Okay, my friends. We are talking about losing the war against ISIS, which, God forbid, if this ever really happened, do you have any idea the ramifications of radical Muslims taking over the United States of America? You think this is a laughing matter? You think it can't happen here? You know, many of us walk around like it can happen here. Well, Germans walked around when Hitler took power, saying he's a nut. As eh, a bunch of right-wing nuts, they're never going to get anywhere, even though he was a left-wing nut. And, uh, well, the rest is history. What would happen if these rebellious, radical, insane rapists and killers were to succeed in taking over America. Now, some would argue they've taken over a good portion of America already without killing. They just use the killing to intimidate and cow everybody. But they've penetrated every level of government. They've penetrated every level of academia. They've penetrated the United States media. So, in essence, how much more can we take of this war against Islam when Islam is at war with us? You know that, and I know that. Let's stop mincing words. You have to trip over it every time you are about to say what you know is going on. They call themselves the Islamic State. How could you not see it related to Islam? Now, I understand if I were a Muslim listening to the show, I might be offended. And that's an offense that you're going to have to live with. Because what I'm saying is what most Americans believe and what most Americans say. They want to know how you could be a member of a religion that has so many members that hate us so much that hate everyone but uh, those who adhere to this this uh, fundamentalist vision. And how extensive is this uh, problem? How many radicals are there amongst the Muslims in America? Let's forget the world. We can't do anything about them over there unless in your Obama you bring more of them in. We keep hearing from political leaders that Muslims have nothing whatsoever to do with terrorism. We keep hearing that there's 99 points that 99 percent of them share Western values, or 99.99 of them share Western values. And yet, according to the Muslim human rights activist Rahil Raza, the real figures are much different. The untold story is much different 
if you would actually listen to a Pakistani-born human rights activist and a devout Muslim herself who has spent the last 20 years speaking out against Islamic extremism. She's put together a film by the Clarion Project which provides the real figures about the threat of Islamic extremism. You want to hear some of their findings? According to this film, the data published by the left-wing Pew Research Center, 39% of Muslims, that's 345 million of them, surveyed think it can often sometimes or rarely be justified to kill a woman if she engages in premarital sex or adultery. 52% of Muslims, that's 281 million people surveyed, support Sharia law, which uh, favors corporal punishment, such as whipping or cutting off hands of thieves. 27% of Muslims, that's 237 million people surveyed, believe apostates should be executed. 51% of Muslims, that's 289 million people surveyed, support Sharia law, are in favor of stoning unfaithful spouse, spouses. You want more? Are you ready for more for your Muslim friends amongst you? This study by a devout Muslim herself also cites a Pew study which found that among Muslims aged 18 to 29 living in Western countries, 26% of American Muslims, 35% of British Muslims, and 42% of French Muslims believe suicide bombings against non-Muslims can be justified. Is that radical? What you consider radical is considered normal in many parts of the Muslim world, according to Ms. Raza, R-A-Z-A. It's in a new movie. She says, while the vast majority of Muslims don't believe in suicide bombing, killing apostates, honor killings and stonings, hundreds of millions of them do. We need to have an honest conversation about this. And the film challenges viewers to put aside charges of racism or Islamophobia and fear-mongering, etc., and really look at it straight on. And it's a narration by Rahil Raza, a devout Muslim herself, Pakistani-born, but she's a human rights activist, unlike CARE and the other front groups, who will always apologize for one terror attack after another. So what's the problem then? The problem is, do the uh, fine gentlemen that Obama showed off this morning understand any of this? Does Mr. Clapper understand this? Does Mr. Brennan understand this? Do you really think they understand the problem that they're facing? And if they did, do you think they would do anything about it? So we go back again to what can we do about it. And we're hoping for a future time when Donald Trump becomes president, I would say, or someone who's a conservative. But that's a, that's a long shot because, you know, it's not that I don't think Ted Cruz is a good guy. He's un unelectable. I'm sorry, I'll say it again. I know that there are a lot of Ted Cruz supporters in my audience, and I respect that. But I'm a realist. In a general election, there's something about Ted Cruz that makes him unelectable. I looked at him very carefully. You know, the medium is the message. A lot of an election has to do with looks. He has a certain weird weirdness to his look. I'm sorry to tell you, it's just the way it is. If you look at his eyes, there's a deceptiveness. There's, there's certain things about Ted Cruz that would make him unpalatable to the general electorate. They don't even know who's running on the Republican side. They know Donald Trump. That's about it. And then a whole slew of other guys. They don't know who they are. They're not going to pay attention to the election until um, next Labor Day. Then they'll pay attention to the election. Labor Day 2016. That's well established. Then they'll say, eh, who should I vote for? And that's how it's going to be. Now, they take a look. They're going to have the old hag Hillary Clinton. Most of them detest her. She is the most detested of all candidates. Women don't like her. Millennials distrust her. And yet it's the only thing a Democrats can, uh, can, can offer us is Hillary Clinton. I wouldn't mind if a Democrat had a, a conservative Democrat, a patriotic Democrat. They did, by the way. There was one of them. Who? What was his name? I don't want to get the name wrong. Was uh, the, the, he was the um, the former Navy guy? I tried to get him on the show. He was on one debate once. I, I've already forgotten his name. I don't want to get it wrong. I know, it, huh? Jim Webb. Sorry about that. I thought Jim Webb would have been a fantastic Democrat candidate, but they dismissed him right out of the box because he was too patriotic. Uh, and he was too uh, oriented towards solving problems the right way, which is the American way. 
and they got rid of him. Instead, they have this character, O'Malley, who's a fake Jim Webb. Anyway, that's, that's irrelevant. What I'm saying is I'm not a fan of Ted Cruz because he can't win. He cannot win. He simply cannot win. Ted Cruz would probably be a great Secretary of State or in some other great department. I, I don't think he could ever win against even Hillary Clinton. That's why I'm not a fan of Ted Cruz. He's unelectable. He doesn't have the, uh, the look for it. And his voice is squeaky. He has a squeakiness to the world, doesn't he? I'm sorry, his voice is a little squeaky. He just doesn't present properly to be a president. And you looked at that group of candidates. Did you see how Trump towered over everyone? Height matters, man. I got to tell you, in leadership, people tend to gravitate towards tall people. Take it from someone who's not tall. I have had a fight that my whole life. And because I was blessed with other characteristics than height, I've been able to succeed to the level I've succeeded. But the fact of the matter is everybody understands that height definitely does attract uh, respect and it does attract attention. But he has a lot more than height, by the way. He has a lot more than height. Yeah, he mangles sentences. I get that. He mangles sentences. He has bad grammar. I get all of that. That's part of how he delivers his speeches, by the way. It's in shorthand. I've come to understand one of the reasons that Trump is still acceptable, even though he mangles sentences and his English is imperfect, is because it's part of his shorthand. See, he comes from a New York businessman's background, which you don't understand unless you're from the New York area. People speak differently than in the rest of the country. They don't waste time with words. You know that they start sentences and don't finish them in New York in, in, high, in high circles? They're not worried about being misperfect, about finishing every little dot. They can telegraph what they're saying with a half a sentence. Because the other guy's as fast as he is, so he got it before it... He never says three words, the guy knows what he's talking about. He doesn't have to be exactly right with every little detail. Like all of the minis out there saying, oh, he didn't finish this, he mangled his tenses are wrong. That doesn't matter. People don't care. Secondly, with the level of education in America, I think it actually makes more sense to them now that he doesn't speak full sentences. That's good because they, they can't follow what most people are saying anyway. So let's go back to the topic at hand on the Savage Nation. I promise not to uh, stick on this topic the whole day. We're talking about hackers. We're talking about cybersecurity. I did promise to give you a little peek inside Unit 8200, Israel's top secret cyber spy agency, which is filled with bright, geeky teenagers. Did you know that? Did you know that there's a graduation ceremony recently for this group? It's a three-year after-school program for 16- to 18-year-old students who have exceptional computer coding and hacking skills. And the organization is called Mag Shamim. Mag Shamim, which means fulfillment. Mag Shamim. It's a secret science park in Beersheba, Israel. Mag Shamim. Three-year after-school program for 16- to 8-year-old students with exceptional computer coding and hacking skills. And it serves as a feeder system for potential recruits to Unit 8200, the Israeli military's legendary high-tech spy agency, considered by intelligence analysts to be one of the most formidable of, the, of its kind in the world. Unit 8200, or Shimon Matayim, as it's called in Hebrew, is the equivalent of America's national security agency and the largest single military unit in the IDF. It's an elite institution whose graduates, after leaving service, can parlay their cutting-edge snooping and hacking skills into jobs anywhere in the world. Israel, Silicon Valley, Boston's high-tech corridor. And so you have to look into this. More than half of those in that organization were boys, but there were girls too. And 8200 is open to both. And so the fact is, applicants are not admitted simply if they have high computer skills. They're admitted only after an online questionnaire followed by a battery of more rigorous tests to gauge their abilities in programming, languages, and thinking outside, they say outside the... Anytime I hear thinking outside the box, I know people can't think outside the box. As someone who's always thought outside the box and performed outside the box, whenever I hear someone saying, let's think outside the box, I go to sleep and leave. Another program targets children in central Israel where wealth and opportunities are greater. And of the 1,400 children who applied last year, about 500 got in. Did you hear that? So in other words, it's highly competitive. They don't take everybody. 
School can be boring for these bright kids. Some fail, one of the instructors said. But they can do their best here, so they love it. You get